Thank you for joining us tonight to celebrate Black History Month. 22 years ago, I started a program to celebrate Black History Month. It was Black Culture Night in Blue Island. My first program was in Blue Island Public Library, and today we're back in Blue Island Public Library. We have several guests to come and help us celebrate. Tonight we're talking about William Steele, the creator of the Underground Railroad. The most important thing that uh, William Steele was known for was keeping a record. But first of all, we have several people that's going to perform. Our first performer is Myra Evans. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory. Let us march on till victory. Let us march on till victory is won. We have Aisha, she's going to tell us the, about the founder of Black History Month, Woodson Carter. The father of Black History Month, Carter G. Woodson, was born in 1875 near New Canton, Virginia. He was a son of former slaves. In 1907, he obtained his bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago. In 1912, he received his PhD from Harvard University. In 1915, he and his friends established the Association of the Study of Negro Life and History. A year later, the Journal of Negro History began quarterly in publication. In 1926, Woodson proposed and launched the annual February Observance of Negro History which became Black History Month in 1976. It is said that he chose February for the observance because February 12th was Abraham Lincoln's birthday and February 14th was the accepted birthday of Frederick Douglass. Dr. Woodson was the founder of the Associated Publishers the founder and editor of the Negro History Bulletin, and the author of more than 30 books. His best known publication is The Miseducation of the Negro, originally published in 1933 and still relevant today. He died in 1950, but Dr. Woodson's legacy goes on.
children wait in the water. Gods are gonna trouble the water. See that band all dressed in white. Gods are gonna trouble the water. William Steele is the father of the Underground Railroad. William was born during a time that the United States of America was divided in two. In the North, African Americans were free. In the South, they were enslaved. African people were kidnapped and shipped across the Atlantic Ocean under hor horrific conditions. Then they were sold into slavery. Slaves were chained and sold at auctions. Children were separated from their families and sold into auctions also. They were whipped tortured and forced to work under terrible conditions with no pay. William Steele was born on October 7, 1821, and is the youngest of 18 children. He was a businessman, historian, civil rights activist, and a conductor of the Underground Railroad. When William was a young boy, his neighbor was attacked and captured. The neighbor was a man that had once been enslaved in the South. William's neighbors escaped from his slave abductors again. The young boy was called by his other neighbors to help this man. William was very familiar with the woods and led the man through them. This moment defined William. He was often called the father of the Underground Railroad. William helped reunite families by keeping records of their destination and a brief biography of them. He discovered he aided his own brother whom he had never met. The records that he kept were very important history. Harriet Tubman escaped slavery and made many missions to rescue enslaved people, including family and friends. This was documented by William Steele. Henry Box Brown arranged his freedom by mailing himself in a wooden crate to Philadelphia. William knew these records were very important and his life was in danger because of this. Mr. Steele hid the records in the graveyard behind a dark vault. In 1872, William published a book, The Underground Railroad. William's stories needed to be told to let people know that slavery is a inhumane nightmare. My God is gonna trouble, gonna trouble the water. We have a wonderful guest this evening. His name is Tyron Haymore. Tyron Haymore is a historian from Robbins, Illinois. He's the director of the Robbins Museum. Tyron Haymore is in the process now of getting, he has a, a, a museum, but he's trying to get a larger museum. Tyron, Hay, Tyron Haymore has more information about Blue Island versus Robbins. So he's gonna uh, give us a little education on the connection of Robbins, one of our sister cities. Uh, Tyron Haymore was in our program 20 years ago. He was in there 10 years ago. He has a lot of information about the South Side Black history. Okay, we have our very special guest. Uh, from Robbins, Illinois. We have Tyrone Haymore, the director of the Robbins Museum. Uh, Ro he has a lot of history of Blue Island and Robbins, and uh, he's our special guest today. Okay, I have a few questions for you uh, with your museum. I know you told me that they had a slave, a slave house in Robbins. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tell us a little bit about the connection of Robbins and Blue Island. That's what I probably want to know first. 
Well, you might say Blue Island gave birth to Robbins. Uh, um, the Rob, Blue Island, of course, were here way longer before Robbins. But when the blacks came into this area, um, they first came here in 1892. It was the first arrival of the blacks in the area that is now called Robbins. And, of course, it was just a farmland. It was farmland where a few white farmers live, it, live. Probably no more than 12 large white farmers were in the area that is now called Robbins. And the few blacks that moved in, uh, they were given this land. They were actually introduced to that area by a man named Henry E. Robbins, who it later got his name from. Okay. Mr. Henry Robbins had bought up a large tract of land. He had even tried to acquire Blue Island for the city of Chicago. And if you know, the World's Fair of 1893, I think it was, uh, was coming to the Chicago area, and they were going to need large tracts of land. The uh, A.J. A. Smith Realty Company out of New York sent their, got a hold of their agent in Chicago and told him to start buying up as much land south of 47th Street in Chicago as he could. And that included communities like Beverly Hills, uh, Marinette Park, and all these all little towns, and the area that later became Robbins. And uh, so this was land before the blacks came, before Robbins people came. And, uh, but it was the city of Blue Island that halted uh, them from buying up land south of 119th Street. Uh, Blue Island went into court and said that it was as old as the city of Chicago and it had no intentions of being connected to Chicago okay. by its government and the court agreed. And therefore, they stopped the A.J. Smith Realty Company from going south of 119th Street, which is the boundary line, you know, there between That's Chicago right. and Blue Island. And uh, therefore, the land south, which included what's now Robin, was also uh, saved from that an annexation. So Mr. Robin was left with all this land and uh, that he had bought for his company in New York. Now, what are we going to do now that we can't use it? But they were buying it to go along with the uh, the the World Columbian Exposition that was coming because they had said they were going to lar need large tracts of land. But he bought this land up and uh, he got orders from New York to sell the land for as cheap as he can to get rid of it as quickly as possible. And uh, he wasn't getting rid of it as fast as his company wanted. So he started even trying to maybe even give some of the land away for <laughs> something. But then he heard about some blacks that was living in the back of the yard section of Chicago who were having serious racial problems. And he said, because they weren't adjusting well, because they came from the South, most of them were uneducated, had very little skills other than farming skills. He said, I bet you I could sell this land to them because this looks just like where they came from, Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. So he sold uh, land that's now called Robbins to the blacks that had settled in the back of the yard section of Chicago for as low as 25 and 50 dollars a lot oh, wow. and the blacks just fled out here to mr rob said buy give me this give me this and they loved it because it reminded them of the south where they came from yeah. now they can they can live because they know how to farm right they and so uh most of them half of them couldn't read or write that well and so mr rob began to sell and they just bought up the land like crazy and before long they had over 300 families Oh, that's wonderful. Black families living in this farm area just south of present-day Blue Island. And, uh, but it was still, it was unincorporated area of Blue Island, but Blue Island uh, still had the oversight of this area. So as the blacks were building up in the area that we call Robbins now, uh, they were needing services uh, just to buy goods and services, what have you, but also they uh, needed to... Um, they were having fires. They, the houses that they would build would catch on fire because they didn't have a lot of stuff they got now. Yeah. 
And also, they had problems where they needed police service, and they didn't have a police department. Mm -hmm. So they had to depend on Blue Island for all of that. Well, Blue Island was, was servicing them, but they were getting a little tired of it, too, because yeah. they were giving them services that they weren't paying for yeah. through their taxes, because they weren't being taxed. Right. And it was really the Blue Island official who told this black settlement in, of blacks and robins, why don't you all think about forming your own government, have your own city, and tax your own self, and then get money that you can have to buy your own fire truck there and leave us alone? Because now the blacks were complaining that they weren't putting out the fires fast enough. They were doing criminal activities in our, uh, among our, the black community out there. And the judges, anything that went wrong, if black came up here to court, they would throw it out. Oh, okay. Blacks couldn't win in no courts in Blue Island at that time. So Mr. Keller, Thomas J. Keller, was a more enlightened one among the blacks who said, yeah, I think they gave us a good suggestion. We need to form our own town and have our own government, have our own police department, our own f fire department, and tax the citizens for to make this all happen. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what happened. And in uh, 1917, they, they took, a, they, uh, 16, they took a vote, and the vote was three to one to incorporate. Oh, that's wonderful. And they incorporated, and that following year, they were full-blown uh, certified by the state of Illinois as a uh, incorporated community. And they named it Robbins. How he got his name Robbins from the man who Originally. gave him, uh, sold him the land. Yeah. Uh, but he died. He died two years before they incorporated Robbins. But it was his son, Eugene Robbins, mm -hmm. who said, I understand you're looking for a name for the music. Why don't you name it after my dad? Look what he did for you all. Yeah. And uh, so they, they said, well, uh, we need some money to pay off all these legal expenses. We, did. we need $300. We need... So he said, well, here, I'll give you the 300 Mr. Eugene Robbins' son gave him the $300. So he said, okay, here, he gave us the money. All right, thank you. Now we can pay the bills off here that we got, and we'll uh, certainly okay. name the town after your father. That's wonderful. So it was named after uh, Henry Robbins mm -hmm. by his son, Eugene Robbins, who gave the $300. Mm -hmm. And that's how Robbins got his name. That's wonderful. Now, you have a museum in Robinson. I've been knowing you now for about, what, 20 years? Yeah. And when you first started out, you was uh, doing, uh, collecting money, giving different programs so that you could get enough money. I remember you, I, I believe you had a glass jar and uh, <laughs> uh, collecting money so that you could get the building. You got a building, but you wanted a bigger one. Mm -hmm. So who started, uh, who started as far as the Robbins Museum? We had talked at one time. Yeah. And, uh. Actually, our museum is now 30, about 38 years old. It was started by a little woman named Miss Eddie Lou Allen. She was very popular in Robbins. Uh, she was one of the children of one of the pioneer founders of Robbins, one okay. of the first family, black family moved there. She was the ch one of the children that grew up there. And she knew how important the history was, and she started gathering a group of people that included me. I was among the youngest members that she organized. We were meeting in her house, mm -hmm. and she was trying to tell us how important saving the history of Robbins was, mm -hmm. and that she wanted us to help her. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to write a book about Robbins' history, how we got started, so that we remember this. Mm -hmm. So we were meeting in her house for, oh my God, 20-some years, and we got a few visits uh, at the library and at the community center, but mm -hmm. uh, most of the meetings were in her house. But Eddie Lou, Mrs. Eddie Lou Allen was the founder but she died after we had been organized only about four years. Okay. She died of cancer, and then it passed on to Mrs. Bender, and then Mrs. Bender died. Mm -hmm. And then people started slacking off, and some just left and didn't want to be a part of it anymore. They didn't think it was going to go any place. But I saw the importance, and it woke me up about the history, because mm -hmm. I, I was a history major in school, mm -hmm. uh, and I decided to keep it going. That's wonderful. So I reestablished the uh, the historical society, but when I found out that there was no money out there for historical societies, they said, well, if you want to get some real money, you need to be a museum, because there are no money out there for no historical societies. Oh, okay. I That's said, oh, historical right, museum. it's a big oh, difference okay. uh, from the funding uh, people. The, so yeah. anyway, we, we reorganized under my leadership and uh, got the state to give us a charter as a museum. Okay. So we're the Robbins Historical Society Museum. Okay. And uh, the building that we got, 
was given to us by my godparents. My godparents had a grocery store that they got too old to run, and then they moved back to Alabama, and they left here. Mm-hmm. And they uh, so they, they put the building up for sale. The building wouldn't sell. Nobody wanted to buy it. Mm-hmm. And it had been used as a grocery store and a liquor store at one time after my godparents left it. They rented it to a, a fellow that turned it into a liquor grocery store. Mm-hmm. But uh, then they had a problem there that where they closed it. And it was closed for a number of years for a sale sign. Nobody would buy it or use it. Mm-hmm. So I asked them, I said, well, we need a place for our new his- historic right. site. I was saying, how about selling it to us or even giving it to us, you know? Yeah. And so basically they gave it, my godmother, uh, father gave it to her, gave yeah. it to me. They gave yeah. me the building. When they found out what I wanted to do, right, exactly. they were really pleased about that. And they said, well, you can have it as long as you take care of all the expenses and whatever. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, in a sense, it was a gift to us oh, that's from my cool. godparents. That's the best. So thing. we were able to build a building, put up the signs, advertise, and we we're well on our way. And uh, now we need a bigger facility, which yeah. is what we're working on now. We're trying to raise money. The SB Fuller Where, Mansion. Excuse me. Where, okay. Where's it located at? Your new building you're trying to get? Uh, uh, well, okay, the old building was located at 3644 West 139th Street. In Roberts, if anybody knows where Londell Avenue is at the corner of Londell and 139th. Now, the new facility that we're trying to build is the, uh, trying to re- re- rehab, is a mansion that was left by one of the richest man in Robbins, who was a multimillionaire, Mr. S.B. Fuller. And he died in uh, 1988, and his wife died 10 years later in 99, and the house was left there and. Uh, no family members of his was 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 able to maintain the place, mm-hmm. and it went through several hands. And everybody that got it couldn't handle it, mm-hmm. and it finally ended up was uh, the last owner, Mr. Davis, decided that he thought he was going to be able to use it, but he can't use it now. But he wanted his money back, <laughs> so he decided to put the house up for sale, and it didn't sell. Mm-hmm. Um, so he. Um, uh, he said somebody suggested, well, you need to give it to a non-for-profit organization so you can get your money back. Right. And so somebody said, well, we have a Robbins History Museum here. Maybe they would be interested in a bigger place than where they are, and this would be it. Maybe they would be interested in taking it. So sure enough, they approached me, and I said, yeah, we'll mm-hmm. take a mansion, you know. We'll find some way to fix it up and find the money. But we've had it now for th- over three, a little over three years, and we have not been able to raise the uh, amount of money that we need, and we need pretty close to three hundred thousand dollars now, because we're still paying taxes on it, and the little money that we've been raising has all been going to taxes. Yeah. They won't stop the taxes on this uh, uh, not-for-profit organization until they see the museum inside that property. Oh, okay. They have to inspect to make sure that it is a museum. If, if they don't see a museum in there, uh-huh. it's still a residence. Therefore, it's still taxable. Now, now the people, they were really the people who own Fuller Brush Company? No. That's a a big, big, big mistake mistake people are making. Fuller Brush Company was a whole different company. That was a white-owned company. Uh, That's Fuller Brush. Fuller Products. Oh, okay. Fuller Products is the company that was owned by the rich black man, Uh named S.B. Fuller. And the S.B., and you'll see it online and wherever... SB did not stand for anything but letters. SB, <laughs> you'll see, uh, you'll see a Samuel B. Fuller, who uh-huh. was a wealthy white man back in the eighteen hundreds, uh-huh. but that's not the same. That's not the person. That was a white guy who was um, uh, wealthy, but he lived in the eighteen hundreds. Mm-hmm. Now, now the Fuller Company, that's the company that used to make the ointments and yes, the Fuller like was that. known for selling soaps, cosmetics, right, and. Uh, and he got into little things like vanilla extract right, I remember that. and stuff like that. You have to be older. Right. He had nothing, to do, had nothing to do with brushes at all. Yeah, okay. No. Okay. Well, you cleared that up for me. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you you had mentioned uh, years ago that uh, uh, the Underground Railroad possibly went through Robbins. Yeah. We found we, there's a house in Robbins. I meant to bring a picture. I wasn't able to find it, but I do have a picture of a house in Robbins. When the first blacks moved there, they knew about this little house, 
And they always refer to it, the old slave house. That's all they ever knew, the old slave house. Who started it back in the 1800s, they don't know. They just know some older white folks from where, somewhere who, who were given help and refuge to runaway slaves. And by being this close to Chicago, it was clearly the next to the last stop of the journey of, of runaway slaves from the South to Chicago. But Chicago was almost as racist as the South, and they had to keep the only real freedom they got was to go to Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was yeah. They that was real freedom. That was there. part of the journey, wasn't right. it? Right. Yeah, to leave here, right. You know, go to Canada, right. Well, but most of them thought free. coming to the north, like Chicago and New York, was it. Oh. But in, the, in Chicago was just just almost as bad as as the South. Okay. During that time. But uh, this house was there, and we didn't know it. Nobody did any research back then, and we're still doing research trying to find out mm -hmm. who the original owners were and if they were the family, in fact, that gave sanctuary to runaway slaves from the South. Okay. We do know that happened right. because there was always a lot of talk about it, but nobody had any specific facts, right. which we're still researching. Right. But we do know the house was still standing there. It was uh, made out of limestone, mm -hmm. which Robbins is full of. Yes. Precious grade A limestone. And like a lot of homes in there and farm were built out of stone. Mm -hmm. But this was a very unusual house. And it was there up until about the 19, I think it was torn down in 19, uh, in the early 1980s. Okay. Uh, and it was, and they didn't haul it away. They actually just demolished the house and they buried it right there in the ground where it stood. Oh, okay. So it's there, it's still there, but it's in the <laughs> underground. Yeah, that's a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> but we have the address. We do have photographs. So fortunately, oh, that was the that was one of the main parade routes. It's on Clare Boulevard, where Clare Boulevard intersects with Turner Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the it's just about where it was on the uh, west side of Clare Boulevard at that point. Now we have pictures of it, uh, of the building. We know the last two families that lived in it, the two black families that lived in it, and they described the interior, which was really odd. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't, they don't build houses like that anymore. I mean, I know a family of about seven people lived in a house that only had one bedroom, and that bedroom really doubled as a living room yeah. in that house. That's really old. Yeah, <laughs> and there was still a pump was in there to pump oh, water wow. and. There was an outhouse in the back. Yeah. It was, yeah, but that's almost unheard. Of. Yeah. yeah. Now, mm -hmm. uh, your your museum you have now is still open to the public. Yes, it is. It just closed now because of the pandemic. And, right. uh, but we are still open by appointment, mm -hmm. and right now we can open during the pandemic. But we have to limit the number of people, and of course you have to have masks on, mm -hmm. and you have to uh, be conscious of distance. And we only permit five in there at a time now. Okay. And so far, we've only had three uh, appointments since okay. the pandemic. Two people's a little afraid to do And believe it or not, I had the third one was today. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and this was just one person that came, but we were a very important person who had to get in there and see our history of our airport, Robbins Airport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Uh, like I said, you've been to several of our, uh, well, you've been to at least three of our uh, Black Culture Nights in Blue Island, mm -hmm. and you helped us over the years, and we, we just wanted to give you a little donation, kind of help you out, maybe oh. some gas or something for your okay. uh, your museum, and uh, we want to tell you how much we appreciate your service. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. Thank you so much. We're trying to keep our history alive, and that, yes. that that's the whole purpose yes. of our of us doing this is for our children. Now, William Steele was uh, an author and, a, uh, and he kept journals. He kept journals of the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. and that was what was so important. And I think people need to know that the journals that they keep today, mm -hmm. that'll be somebody else's history tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for your service. And on behalf of Neighborhood Watch Group 37, okay. we want to give you a donation. Oh, and thank, thank you. you for coming thank and you. Share your uh, knowledge and your experience. I'm with happy us. to, and Robbins is very much a part of Blue Island. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay.
Greetings, this is Mayor Vargas from the City of Blue Island. I want to take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy and safe Black History Month. Again, Black History Month here in Blue Island, we cherish it not only for our own personal experiences but and the people who we love and share our community with, but again, uh, nationwide and worldwide. We know the situations with the famous Martin Luther King, the Jesse Owens of this world, the Rosa Parks, there are good marshals, the Supreme Court justices. Uh, we also have our first black vice president, Camila Harris, and we have the doctor, the scientist who helped develop the vaccine presently for the COVID-19, and many, many more, from inventions to uh, vaccines, uh, scientists, athletes, etc. cetera. Uh, again, we're celebrating Black History Month, and let's stress the word history. Uh, not only in the black culture or black history, it's a, it's a term that we should all cherish and understand so that we don't repeat mistakes in the future and learn from our mistakes. History meaning roots, roots in our community, roots in our family, roots in society. Again, we have a large history of black history of the people who live here in our community, who've lived here in the past, the present, and the future. We've had history of uh, black people uh, who've uh, resided in our community since the early, early 1900s on the northeast quadrant of the city, as well as our southwest quadrant of our city. And then now we have a mixture of people all over the city from north to the south, to the east, and to the west. Again, stressing what history means and where it leads us, we have to learn from our history. Uh, whatever mistakes society have committed in the past. Again, we've learned through the civil rights situation, uh, all the goals, all the strives, uh, accomplishments, whatever our uh, civil rights uh, leaders during that period of time, whether the white, black, Hispanic have fought in what we're cherishing today as a result of those sacrifices, both uh, financial as well as lives that were sacrificed during that period of time to get to where we are today. And again, Given all the sacrifices which our activists, our social leaders have done in the black community that have helped not only white, black, or Hispanic communities to for voting rights, civil rights, etc. Again, we're celebrating Black History Month, the month of February. I encourage all of us to read, take some time uh, when you have free time, check the website, Google, and know who the people in our community within the black community who have made a difference in our lives, both locally, statewide, national, and worldwide. Again, we want to thank everyone for their uh, what they've accomplished through our community, what they have provided in our society. And again, we want to thank everyone uh, and want everyone to celebrate a safe Black History Month. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us to celebrate Black History Month. And the, the lesson this year about uh, William Steele is that he was a journalist and he was an author. And if we learn anything from him, we learned that, that the journal you, you write today, it will be history tomorrow. So I would like to introduce to you now our former alderman and the captain of Neighborhood Watch Group number 37. Nancy Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. You're so wonderful. Another year, and uh, we've given this program, I think now is 22 years. I want to thank everyone for coming today and showing that you really appreciate being educated and entertained. And Ms. Roscoe does a beautiful job of getting that done every year. We assist her, but she does the bulk of the work, all of it. She is the champion of this program, the originator of it, and she has kept her promise to the community to bring you this information every year. I want to thank everyone again for coming, and I'm so happy and so pleased to be here another year to greet everyone 
and to thank you for participating and supporting us all of these years. And thank you so much and have a beautiful and blessed 2021.